And now it's time for That Gets My Goat! Was that okay, Bob? But then I guess they killed Luke, too, so I guess they got rid of all the, uh... The old guard? Yeah, they got rid of all the masters, and they're just gonna let these Padawans... Hey! Yeah, that's another word I hate. I suppose that... Does that predate prequels or is it a prequel thing too well we never heard it before the prequels but it was in the star wars novelization it was something that lucas had in his mind yeah just as sith was also a word that had existed before the prequels but it just had never been defined but yeah they, they've never said padawan in any of these movies and i would imagine that they won't but i don't know well next movie they might when all these kids that like clean the stables come to be jedi and they put those hats on and stand there in the room and say, Maybe someone erased it from the archive. How delightful sex with a child is. <laughs> wait, wait, Master Yoda, what did you say? <laughs> Nothing did I say. Gosh. Sorry, maybe I should cut that as well. <laughs> the, uh, the So the, the one other thing that I wanted to complain about okay. was uh, Benicio Del Toro. Okay, so in the movie, they call Maz Kanata, that's what her name is, right? They call her up and apparently she's like in the middle of a laser battle but she still takes their call and talks to them. Yeah. And tells them, oh, Master Codebreaker at this place, where's this kind of a thing? And it comes up on the screen. And so they go looking for this guy. They find a guy wearing that thing. So we assume this guy is the Master Codebreaker but they don't get to him. They get thrown in jail. And in jail, they meet a guy who happens to be a master code breaker. Well, how about that? I was expecting at some point for them to find out that that was the guy. I wa just wanted him to say, oh, yeah, and somebody stole my red flower pin that I always wear. I'm so mad about that. Or just something. Yeah, I totally expected him to be the master code breaker, too. Like the force was sort of leading them or... or the screenwriters are leading them to where they need to go. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was just too much of a coincidence that, oh, oh, there's also a master code breaker right here in this cell we got thrown into. How about that? The, what was it? Uh, a Pixar rule, wasn't it, where... Coincidence that gets you into trouble is good. Yeah. Coincidence that gets you out of trouble. It is forbidden. Yeah. Oh, is that what it was? It is forbidden? No, that's just the line from Beauty and the Beast. Oh. Yeah, it, that was a bad coincidence that shouldn't have shouldn't have happened. Unless there was some way to explain it around or something like that, you know. I don't know. It, well, that I liked his character. Well, ultimately he became a bad guy. So it it did screw them over. But yeah, he was a master code breaker. Yeah, he was a master code breaker. Uh, I don't think he even became a, a bad guy. I think he stayed what he was. You know, he said, oh, yeah, look at this. They supply the resistance and the first order. How about that? Uh, and it was just kind of a, a statement, I guess, on war. And I liked the, the last thing that he had to say where, you know, this week you blow them up, next week they blow you up. And, then you know, that the cycle just continues or whatever exactly it was that he said. Okay, you know, that that's fair, but I just felt like he was a villain because ultimately he is responsible for all of those deaths. And that was something that didn't make any sense, I'll have to admit. He ratted him out somehow, but he didn't know that plan. Nobody knew that plan. Laura Dern wouldn't even tell it to fucking Poe Dameron on the ship what their plan was, was to sneak out under cloak and get away. How does he know this plan to tell them to, to look for uh, it? I, okay. I, <laughs> you may have me there. <laughs> when I saw that, I was just like, what? How does he know that? I mean, that's bad and all, and it caused problems and stuff, but he wasn't privy to that information in any way. I don't understand. That doesn't make any sense. No, no. I think BB-8 had a communicator that was talking to Poe over on the, the ship, and DJ, don't join, was there for that conversation, where they were talking to Poe and saying, you know, we're going to go in there and get ready to go to 
to light speed. Right, but that was the other plan that didn't work out. That was the plan of they're going to blow up the tracker. And like telling them that plan, that he knew, you know, they were going to stop the tracker so they could go to light speed and, and not be tracked. But the plan of everybody escaping under cloak out of the ship and they just keep following it and they get away to this hidden rebel base and nobody even realizes they're gone and the ship is just empty. That was the plan that Laura Dern wouldn't tell anybody. And yet somehow random guy they picked up on... What's the name of that stupid planet again? Canto Bite. Canto Bite. The guy they pick up on Canto Bite somehow knows this, so... I don't know. Anyways, now I want you to make me cry. Go, tell me about what was so wonderful that I, I need to cry. Well, no, clearly... Uh... You who cry for tampon commercials were not moved by this movie. <laughs> Did you really not cry when there was the dedication to Carrie Fisher in the end credits? Oh, I cried at that. Okay. But that wasn't part of the story. <laughs> no, I just... That didn't. and the other thing which I thought was interesting is I walked out the door right after that dedication and there was a bunch of kids out in the uh, parking lot talking about the movie and they're like, what are they going to do now? The only one left alive is the one who's actually dead in real life. Well, that's a conversation for a... a yeah, a, and I just thought, yeah, that's... I mean, unfortunately, I guess they could always pull a Rogue One and CG her for a scene or two, which I'm not excited about. Or they could do a uh, Superman Returns and use jor you know, takes that they didn't use or something like that to work her in somehow like she's on a ship and, oh, now that ship blew up, darn. I well, yeah, I, I think that, that, again, we should talk about this in that episode sure. when we're talking about what to do in episode nine. But I, I, I think if you're just going to kill her off, there are a number of ways you can do it. But if she is to remain a living character, you're sort of painted into a corner and say, well, OK, uh, she's going to appear as a hologram a couple of times or we're just going to hear her voice or. Speaking of appearing as a hologram, what did you think of that part where R2 shows the uh, message again to him? I love that, man. And he goes, that's a dirty trick. <laughs> Cause it's, that was good. It's the call to adventure, right? For the uh, the hero's journey. Yeah, that was good. You know, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, or my only hope was the invitation for Luke to become a hero. And R2 plays that again. And it was just so neat to see it again. Yeah. To see young Carrie Fisher again. It just, oh, that was really cool. And R2 had almost nothing to do in the movie. Yeah. And I guess that was his one scene. That's one reason I've, I've come to dislike BB-8. And, <laughs> and I think it's just because he's basically just replaced R2. Oh, dude, BB-8 had so much to do in this movie. R2 doesn't do anything, and BB-8 rolls around and freaking pilots uh, Imperial Scout Walkers, and he does all sorts of stuff, and R2 and C-3PO, nothing. They don't do anything. They don't do jack shit. They might as well not be in the show, because they don't do anything. It's not that they used them better in the prequels or anything like that, but I just, I, I feel like that it's sad. That they get no use whatsoever, basically. They're not a part of any action. They're just left behind every time they go to do things. That seems kind of lame. Yeah, did it seem like they had a lot of all is lost moments in this this show? Well, yeah, but the, the whole idea of the movie was that this is the last stand of the rebellion, resistance, whatever you want to call it. There's just... There's nowhere they can go. I, I don't know. We did talk about that. And it may be that's a deal breaker for people too, is just they can keep far enough in front of the Star Destroyer that it can't kill them. You know, the, it can't send just a billion expendable TIE fighters until it is finally destroyed. I mean, it's just like, what's to stop a Star Destroyer from jumping to hyperspace to a hundred feet in front of it huh, yeah, and then just laying into it with its, it, it just, it seemed, I don't want to say convenient, but it seemed awful strange that they were able to survive in this way for as long as they did. 
I mean, I liked when the ships were running out of fuel and finally like falling out of the sky and being destroyed and all that stuff. But it just, that was a contrivance so that, you know, you could extend this chase forever. But then like right. Ray is able to show up and get in an escape pod and, and go over there. And, and yeah, Finn and Rose are able to take off and go to a casino planet and then come back, you know, and it's a good point. Are we to believe that there weren't a hundred X wings or 25 B wings or A wings or U wings or F wings in those ships that could all just take off in, in separate directions and, and escape. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that what they ought to have done all along, instead of waiting to till we're I don't know close to the. I mean, all those things seem to have hyper. I mean, an X wing can do a hyperspace jump. They're not short range fighters. I don't know. But yeah, there was a lot of those all is lost type moments. You know, it kept being like, oh, this is the point. You know, there's always the point in a movie like this where, oh, it, everything is about to go. You know, like in the Avengers when everybody is uh, getting beat up finally. You know, Hawkeye's out of arrows and Hulk is all out of muscles and the nuclear bomb is going Nick Fury couldn't stop it and it's and it's all over. It's the all is lost moment. They had like three of them. I kept thinking, okay, and then they would get through it. And I was like, okay, there's the big finale. All right, cool. Oh, wait, no. It's not the big finale because now they're going down to that planet and they're fall. Okay, I guess. We'll, and then they have another all is lost where all the fighters go out and none of them win and they're all killed and and Finn's going to sacrifice himself but instead Rose crashes into him and sacrifices herself and then they blow a hole in the door and they have nowhere to go and it's the all is lost moment again but then another thing happens I don't know I think there may have been three all is lost moments in there if I remember right and you're saying that there were too many or you didn't buy it or you don't like all his lost moments? You're saying you're a Family Guy fan? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I bought it completely. I just, it was not as bad as the uh, Return of the King where they kept having endings and endings and endings. But it was kind of like that, you know, where the third act kept happening again and again. Not that it was bad. It was just, it was fooling me. You know what I mean? Where I'm like, okay, we're... We're coming into the end here. And then, oh no, that wasn't the end. There's another end here. Okay. And then you get to the end of that one. You're like, okay, now what? Are we going to have a chase? Like they pick up all the all the people that are left in the Millennium Falcon. And now they have a chase as they fly away. And Kylo Ren is flying after them in a TIE fighter. A Darth Vader style TIE fighter where it's pointy on the front. But then that didn't happen. So I guess it really was the end. I don't know. Okay, well, I, I guess I hear what you're saying. My cousin told me after, I saw it with my cousin, and he said that knowing the way that Force Awakens ended, you know, with the top of the, the mountain and then the movie just ends, he was afraid that when Luke and Kylo Ren face off, that the credits would roll. And that they would just choose to end it like that, like Force Awakens ended. <laughs> and uh, he was really relieved that it didn't end that way. I mean, I felt like it had a definitive ending. It ended, and then there was a coda. Yeah, it did. You know, I guess to go back to Return of the King, you know, there was just coda after coda after coda after coda in that, but I don't know. I, I there There is a section of the middle of the movie where things don't really work as well as they should, or, or I can say they don't work, whatever. But I feel like from a certain point, from about the point where Holdo chooses to, you know, turn the cruiser and smash into the, the Imperial fleet to the end that they're firing on all cylinders and the movie just comes together. It becomes inevitable. All these things that happen don't feel like story points that a screenwriter came up with, they feel like, oh, this is just naturally what happened next. 
And I just feel like all of that worked. I, I don't know the name of that planet with the salt, but it's like every scene on that planet worked for me. I don't know, it just had a super strong final act, in my opinion. That planet was called Saltobite. Saltobite. <laughs> Dildo bite. Yeah, it, it was very strong at the end. That's definitely true. It, it, it's interesting where you had parallel scenes that went to different stuff. Like the end there, their big final battle on Salt Planet, it felt like Hoth base. Absolutely. It even had ad ads. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you had the Emperor's Throne Room, and then you had the Pod Race, and then you had, I guess you had Dagobah with, what did you think of those cute Porg mammal penguins? <laughs> well, I like the Porgs. We've had this conversation already that on Force Friday, the day that all the Last Jedi toys came out, the Porg was the one thing that had sold out from the store that I went to. And so I got it into my head, hey, you know, these things might end up being rare when it comes time for the movie to come out. And so for a month or so there, I just bought up every Porg I saw, spent a fortune on Porgs, knowing that I had the receipts if I turned out to be wrong. But yeah, about mid-November, suddenly no stores had Porgs anymore. And so for the last three weeks... I've just sat back and sold my porgs. And so, I know it's a long route to get there. <laughs> I quite like the porgs. <laughs> I know that they're cutesy characters and that people hate that. But I grew up in the 1980s and never had a problem with the Ewoks. And so I'm an easy sell. I don't mind the porgs at all. All right. Plus, Chewie does roast one. Yeah, but he doesn't eat it. I wanted him to just bite into it anyways. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're like my cousin. I wanted him to say, screw you, vegetarians, and just chomp on it. I'm going to post in concept art. You know, the, they have a book every time one of these movies comes out called The Art of The Force Awakens. Uh -huh. Anyway, in the, the art of The Last Jedi, somebody did a painting of the Porgs with Anakin's lightsaber. You remember that he tosses it and there are a couple of porgs like playing with it when Ray goes and retrieves it. Oh, right. But anyway, there is an image of the porg turning on the lightsaber and impaling another porg. I was just delighted by it. I've shown that picture to everyone that I know that has seen Last Jedi. <laughs> and I can't unsee it now because they're... There's that moment. So, yes, I, I, you would have liked it better had that scene been included. <laughs> I didn't hate the Porgs, although I kind of wish they had been left behind on that planet when they left instead of on the Falcon. That's right. There, There is one on board the Falcon in that final scene. Yeah. The very last scene, they have this like bit where they're like, we're the resistance. We're what's left. And they have everybody in the Falcon like all together doing kind of like a little pose, like what would be on the poster or something at the end. And like sitting on R2's head or something is one of those porgs. Like he's one of the <laughs> freaking top lieutenants of what's left of the resistance. Yeah. They were fun for, you know, a little bit. Although they were so much, they looked so much like penguins. I felt like they could have, you know, you know how like in the making of specials that they did for uh, like Return of the Jedi and stuff like that, they would show George Lucas and he'd have his people and they would build like a model of what Jabba the Hutt would look like. And then they'd show it to him and he'd say, oh, that's too slug like. And so then they'd build it. Oh, too human like. And they'd build another one. Oh, yeah, that's the one. I felt like they needed to do that process a little further. Be like, too penguin-like. And then come back with another one. Well, I feel bad because I've sent you a Porg for Christmas and it's too late to unship it. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I can sell it for a lot of money, apparently. Ah, okay, there you go. <laughs> I This has been long enough. This could be two episodes. Should it be two or just one? It can be if you want to make it. 
I want you to take us out on a high note, though. I've been Debbie Downer the whole time, and you've just sat there and taken it. Well... I want you to explain to me why you cried beyond just saying, I, didn't you cry? I mean, it, that... <laughs> well, it puts me on the spot, but... And maybe that puts you on the spot too much, but... The thing that's so great about the internet is everybody can bash The Room or Batman and Robin or Plan 9 from Outer Space or, in my case, Man of Steel. You know, it's so easy to say this sucks and this is why it sucks. But nobody dares to put themselves on the line and say, this is why I love anal sex. Pearl Harbor. And you took it right out of my mouth. Wait, what? Pearl Harbor was the example that I was... Wait, wait, what? (laughs) You said something else and then said, took it out of my mouth. Um, What's going on here? (laughs) I, I, I think I remain the only person in the world that not only liked Pearl Harbor, but loved Pearl Harbor. And when I tell people that, they're just like, (laughs) no, tell me the joke. You do know who directed Pearl Harbor, right? And I can't explain it, except for that when I saw that, it really spoke to me and emotionally touched me. And I felt like Michael Bay reeled in some of his more destructive tendencies as a filmmaker of you know the shaking the camera and tons of cg and you can't tell what's going on and but i can't express how it made me feel except for you know making yourself vulnerable emotionally vulnerable to somebody else and so you know yeah i i I accept it when people are like oh yeah well your opinion means nothing because you like pearl harbor (laughs) But especially seeing it the second time and knowing that Luke was going to die. Early on in the movie, when he's refusing the call, he says to Rey, what, do you expect the great Luke Skywalker to step out and face the whole First Order all by himself? Like, you know, it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. But he comes on to Salto Bites base... (laughs) <laughs> and he has a moment with Leia. He gives her the the dice and he kisses her on the forehead like he did in Return of the Jedi. And then he goes out to face Kylo Ren and 3PO sees him and says, Master Luke. And Luke winks. And then he walks out and he has, you know, okay, the big confrontation with Kylo Ren Solely so that the rebels, and I keep saying rebels and empire, but I don't care at this point, I'm old. It's the same thing. So that the rebels can have time to escape. Because the door was blown in and uh, there was nowhere for them to go. So they all would be annihilated, and, but he created a distraction. One of those things where all the stormtroopers stand around with their cigarettes and watch Lord Vader fight this old dude. And it's like, yeah, oh, I know I'm supposed to be a god in the uh, detention block, but shit, look, Lord Vader, he's got his light stick again. What's it called? Laser sword, that's right. Ten dollars that the old man gets sliced in half. And I love that, you know, he, he, he lectures Kylo Ren and kind of humiliates him in front of all these people and then it's proved that he's not there and then he says see you around kid and he disappears and the see you around kid felt like this is what your dad would say if he were here right now I don't know it's, that's, that's how it felt it's like he was channeling Han Solo then he, he disappears and I guess the strain is too much for him or he's expended all of his energy or, or, or whatever it is. Maybe this was a pact that he made with the Force and now I've done what I needed to do and now I can, you know, become one with the Force like Master Yoda did. But he looks and there's a binary sunset. And John Williams, the great John Williams, 
plays the music that he played when Luke looked at the binary sunset 40 years ago. And yeah, Luke just disappears. I, 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 it moved me the first time I saw it. But when I saw it the second time, it was one of those where you're actually going, <laughs> uh, uh, it's the first 10 minutes of up. It's that level of like <laughs> emotional beating. And it spoke to me as a person, as a fan of Star Wars, as a believer in these characters, a believer in the Force, as somebody who's idolized Luke Skywalker since I was a little, little boy, that this is the end of the Luke Skywalker story. And this is how they chose for him to go out, not with a bang, but with a contemplative look at two sunsets again. I, you know, it became poetry instead of filmmaking. And it, it, it resonated with me. And it's like, that's how I will remember Luke Skywalker now. Yeah, I like that. That's uh, one thing that I'm glad we got to see, at least in a way. You know, at the end of Return of the Jedi, Luke is a Jedi like his father before him and all that, you know, and he but we never really see him be a badass. We never see him uh, do anything amazing. And when then when we saw the freaking Phantom Menace and they're like, oh, my gosh, did you see that? They ran fast. Oh, that's like a Jedi power. Oh, it's neat. Oh, and they did this stuff. They can jump 200 feet and uh, throw things against the pickup droids and smash them together and do triple flips. and. Yeah, and I, I was all excited about that. And I'm like, this is what we never got to see in the other movies. We got to see Jedis at the height of their powers. And uh, I always felt bad that we never got to see Luke do that because Luke was someone worth seeing do that. Yeah, it uh, just seemed kind of like a bummer. And this bit, you know, I, I, I love the part where they, you know, concentrate all our firepower on <laughs> that guy there. And they just blast and blast and blast. And Hux is like, I think you got him. I, 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 can't, I think you got him. No, I re- okay, stop. Everybody stop. And then he walks out and he like dusts off his shoulder and just stands there again. I loved that part. The 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 shoulder um, dusting thing was so cool. Yeah. I, maybe the coolest thing we ever saw Luke do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was just great. And the way the fight went when they were actually fighting and how Luke just kind of ducked and dodged and it's almost like you're beneath me. I don't even need to bother to raise my lightsaber to you, you douche. I just I I liked the swagger that Luke Skywalker had in that scene and it was it was neat to get to see. I appreciated it much more than him the rest of the movie where he's just like, nah, screw you. And I can understand the get off my lawn mentality because I'm old. I was actually just talking to somebody today. He was watching, gosh, what was on? We were showing Pitch Perfect and I can't remember if that was the movie he was commenting about or not, but it because he was watching another movie too that came on. It's one of those things you can do when you work at a TV station. You got a bunch of monitors going and you can watch a bunch of things all at once. And this guy was watching through various things and then finally he said, Yeah, it's just too bad that I'm old because I can't just let the little things go anymore and know too many things. And so I can't just enjoy a movie. Instead, things jump out at me as, Oh, this doesn't make sense or this isn't cool or this is dumb or. Whatever, and this sounds like a guy I could be friends with. <laughs> and I'm that guy now. I was saying the same thing. I was like, "Yeah, I totally feel that way. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm just, I'm old, and I can't just watch a movie anymore. I, I can't just enjoy it. I go to the Star Wars movie, and I'm like, oh yeah, there's a plot hole, and there's this, and now here I am ruining our talk about it with all of those same comments." And I was saying, you know, like when I was a kid, I loved the Transformers. And when they made movies of them, I was so excited. I was like, oh, Transformers movies, these are going to be so great. And then I watched them and I was just like, ah. Just like, why can't I just like them? But I can't because they're bad. And, you know, kids can do that. Kids go to anything, you know. Like I watched Condor Man 
and thought it was cool when I was a kid. Uh, I loved, I don't know, like Big Trouble in Little China. It's not a good movie, but I loved it all the same. And I still do with that. It's, uh, you know, uh, I guess the glow of the remembrance or whatever. I'm trying to think of the right word and it's not coming to Nostalgia? Me. Yeah, the nostalgia of it. I guess helps save that one. There's other movies it doesn't save, but you know, those movies aren't good, but I liked them all the same. And I still like them because of when I saw them. I know that uh, movie Bob, if anybody uh, ever watches his shows, I know you do sometimes does the whole series of films where he, it's called really that good. And he'll take a movie that is considered a classic and he'll, give it another watch and try and decide is it really that good or is it just you know the nostalgia that props it up he even did it for transformers the the cartoon transformers movie and he came to the conclusion that it was really that good which i totally agree with but i find it interesting because there's so many flaws in that movie it <laughs> really doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of time. It's much worse than the side jaunt to uh, Canto Bite. But yeah, I mean, I guess there's there's one person, going back to what you were saying before, who actually puts it on the line and says, yeah, this is good and this is why it's good. And I think you did a pretty good job when you finally explained what it was that was so moving for you. I think it was uh, it worked. It really came across to me, and I think you're right. In the end, all the little things that I complained about, not a big deal. And what worked out was good. I think it deserves its 92 that it got on the tomatometer. That's such a cool word, tomatometer. Well, you know, you and I are writers. Okay, you are occasionally a writer. (laughs) And a lot of times we talk about, you'll see something that, grabs you and just goes oh my gosh and it makes you want to be a writer and then conversely you'll see something and be just like oh oh my gosh really that made 115 million dollars and you say i can do better than that i want to be a writer you've heard me say that 110 times one for every million dollars that that movie made But if you came to me and said, you have to write an exit for Luke Skywalker, I could not have done better justice to Luke Skywalker. There are people that feel maybe that his being the grouchy old man and, you know, turning his back on the Jedi ways and all that stuff at the beginning of the movie was a betrayal to the character of Luke Skywalker. I believe Mark Hamill felt that way when he first read the script, but it redeems him. He makes a huge difference. It's one of those things where it's just like, okay, he came through in the end. Han Solo and Chewbacca abandon the rebels because they're only in it for the money, but they come through in the end. And uh, I could not have done better. And for me, that is the mark of greatness. I hope that doesn't make me sound too arrogant, but... That's just, I couldn't have done better. Uh, I, I can't complain about, uh, about that. I don't know. I don't know what it would take. I, I definitely don't envy the job of somebody who has to do a Star Wars movie because that's hard. There's a lot of expectations riding on every one of these films. And uh, I'm sure you mess up. The first person who comes out and, and the movie is just a dud... Dude, that guy's never going to work again. Like if this Han Solo one, I've heard there's a lot of problems with it. If that one comes out and does poorly, oh man. People will never let you live it down if you screw it up. Well, I mean, a good example is Batman and Robin. Joel Schumacher's career never really recovered from that. Um, He became a punchline and... uh, you know, I, I, I don't sympathize with him. I don't feel bad for him. I know that he did a commentary 
on the DVD of Batman and Robin, where basically he's, he explains, this was my thinking for this scene and this moment and that. And he apologizes a hundred times, 110 times throughout saying, you know, okay, this was a mistake. And ultimately, you know, in retrospect, this scene does not work. And all right, that the puns, we should have st- stopped with two, you know, that kind of thing. But I still don't sympathize with him. <laughs> But, you know, it shouldn't have been as that difficult to make a good Batman movie. Whereas, yeah, a Star Wars movie is something else. They transcend movies. They're something bigger and more epic and more resonant, more powerful, more deeper than a regular movie. It's like we used to talk about it. The Lord of the Rings was the only comparable franchise where it's just like, this isn't just a movie. This is an experience. This is something <laughs> where you go and you give up your whole night to a Lord of the Rings movie because there's that much going on and that many characters and that much at stake. You don't just go into the movie and turn your brain off. And so, yeah, the fact that Ryan Johnson was able to pull this off, and it's certainly divisive. There are people that hate it. But not only was he able to pull it off, but Lucasfilm has hired him to to go and take the Star Wars saga wherever you want. Do whatever you want with it. You get three movies. Wow, dude. That's amazing. I mean, I I don't know that I envy him that, but uh, they certainly believed in him and will continue to believe in him. Yeah, that's good. That uh, seems like a stamp of approval to me. What uh, was the final take on this show so far? $220 million? Was that the, just the weekend or is that the whole run? I'm assuming that's the whole run. 220 was the, yeah, the Thursday through Sunday. And it might have been, you know, 219 or 223 or something like that. It was the second biggest opening of all time and force awakens still holds the record but i i feel like even leading up to the return the release of the last jedi they didn't expect it to do force awakens business and i I guess we could talk about that it's just there was so much anticipation there were years of anticipation leading up to force awakens But it's also what we talked about a year ago when Rogue One came out. Diminished returns. There's there's less eventness the more Star Wars movies you have. And I feel like Last Jedi was much more eventy than Rogue One was. But we've got another one in a few weeks. Not a few years, kids. Weeks. (laughs) <laughs> and so, yeah, the the more diluted the franchise becomes, I guess the fewer records are going to get set. But I still expect Last Jedi to do 700, 750 domestic. Yeah, I believe it will too. I think the uh, people who didn't like it are, as we said before, a vocal minority. Although sometimes that makes a difference. I mean, they're vocal enough, then it changes people's perceptions. But Well, yeah, certainly good word of mouth will get people that didn't plan on seeing something to go see it. And I guess, you know, if your nephew says, ah, Last Jedi sucked, then maybe you, if you're one of those people that doesn't go see movies every week, will say, oh, okay, well, I'll just wait for a video then. Yeah, and also sometimes people who went and said, yeah, I think I liked that. That was a good movie. And then people keep, no, it sucked because of this, this, and this. And you're like, oh, I was thinking of going to see it again, but maybe I'll just wait till it comes out on video or something like that. I don't know. Well, you're in a position where it's difficult for you to go to see movies at all, let alone to see a a movie a second time or a third time. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee being able to do that on this one or being willing to do that i doubt it we don't even have a dollar movie here as far as i know i haven't discovered it anyways 
Uh, so I really doubt that I'll ever get out to see it again. Other things will come out. Basically, I see a movie because we're going to talk about it on the show. <laughs> if we're not talking about it on the show, I don't watch movies. Because, I, yeah, it is difficult to do. There's been very few movies I've seen otherwise. And yeah, seeing one a second time, I don't know. I mean, the weird thing is I never went and saw The Force Awakens a second time in the theater. But I bought the DVD and then I didn't watch the DVD. So (laughs) I'll probably skip buying this DVD because I should have learned my lesson that it's not a worthwhile use of my money. I don't know. I feel like I should go and sit down and watch The Force Awakens right now, to tell you the truth, just because. Well, I I wonder if you would feel the same that I did seeing it the second time or feel differently. Sometimes you can be bummed out by something or things that don't meet your expectations. But then two weeks pass or three months pass or a year passes and you watch it And you just accept all the things that you didn't like the first time because that's how it is. It's not a surprise anymore. Right. But I don't know. I just, I I noticed things the second time that I didn't notice the first time. For example, there's a shot of Kylo Ren on Salto Bite and he runs his boot through the, the, the salt and leaves that red line underneath it. And then they cut to Luke, and he does the same thing. He moves his boot, and it doesn't make a red line. And the second time I saw it, I, that suddenly was significant to me. It's like, oh, you guys are showing us that he's not really there. Whoa, weird that I didn't pick up on that the first time. Yeah, that's why I was asking whether they actually uh, hit their lightsabers together. I feel like I should watch it again just to see... To watch for that kind of thing. And like there's a moment at the very, very end of the movie when they're aboard the Millennium Falcon and Finn is getting a blanket for Rose and he opens a drawer and there are the sacred Jedi texts. Oh, so you did see that for sure. I thought I'd seen that before and I mentioned it to you and you're like, what? I didn't see that. Oh, okay. You mentioned it. All right. Yeah. I did not pick up on that at all the first time I saw the movie, but it's definitely there. And it makes me want to see it a third time. The scene where Yoda laughs at Luke saying, the sacred Jedi texts or, oh no, you know, suddenly will mean something else because Yoda knows they're not in there. Yeah, there's there's, uh, possibly some worth to that for sure. Maybe I should get out to see it again or buy the DVD and not watch it. One of those two. I'm not sure which. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'm going to trump your buy the DVD and not watch it. I bought the Blu-ray and I don't have a Blu-ray player. (laughs) I think I bought the Blu-ray too, but I have a Blu-ray player. You know, you can get those damn things for really cheap. Yeah, but I'm not going to re-buy my collection just so I can watch we. You can still play regular DVDs on a Blu-ray player. Well, I've had the same DVD player for all these years, and when it finally craps out on me, yeah, I'm sure I'll get a Blu-ray player. Then. You'll get a new one? But yeah, see, we got ours at... Uh, Canto Bite? I don't even remember where. Yeah, it was probably at the Canto Bite uh, gift shop on day after Thanksgiving. And yeah, it was I don't know, 20 bucks. I don't know, it was super cheap. It was, uh, we got it, and we I don't think we even needed it. We're just like, well, we'll get it just in case, I guess. I think at the time we used our PlayStation to play DVD or uh, Blu-rays. We're just like, yeah, I guess we could have this in case, you know, we don't want to use up the PlayStation on playing. And then eventually the PlayStation died, so now we just use that to play DVDs, but they're cheap. <laughs> so you could get the dvd player to watch your blu-ray that you own and don't own a player for because <laughs> you might as well spend more money on this venture <laughs> i guess all that porg money has to go somewhere that's true we have been going this may be the longest episode ever but <laughs> just to extend the episode a tiny tiny bit more let's talk about john williams okay and what you thought of the score I like the score. I mean, how can you not? I've never gone to a Star Wars movie 
and not found something to enjoy. But yeah, I was I was happy when we got to the credits and you know, everybody else got up and walked out and I was just like, you guys don't know what you're missing and I just kind of sat back and just listened to the John Williams music and my kids came down and stood there next to me waiting and I just like, no, I'm sitting here and I'm going to listen to it all and I sat there and listened to it all while they stood there next to me and waited. Impatient youths can't understand that there's something worth experiencing. Yeah, it was really good. I don't know if I recognized anything that came up a lot that was new. If you know what I'm saying. In the last uh, one of these, in Force Awakens, there were several cues, several themes that were new. Uh, You know, you had like a resistance mobilizes kind of a song. And there was Ray's theme and uh, probably a few others that I'm not that aren't jumping to mind, but that's one of those things. You know, even the prequels, I'm glad that they happened just so that we could get that John Williams addition to Star Wars because there was some really, really good music. Uh, Attack of the Clones, that, uh, I want to say it's Across the Stars, was what the uh, song was called, which is their little love theme. So good. It is. It's, it's a fantastic theme. Best addition to the uh, Star Wars, uh, <laughs> the Star Wars pantheon of songs. Wow, that's so weird that you think that, because most people would go with Duel of the Fates, but I too like Across the Stars better than anything in those three movies. It just it so holds up, and I can still hum it to this this day. Yeah, even though I haven't watched those movies in how old am I? How old things, are you? I'm so old. I remember when sex was dirty and the air was clean. <laughs> the uh, the thing that he will do is, you know, he introduces something and then he plays it again and again so that you make a connection, a subconscious connection that this music is when you see Kylo Ren. This This is Ray's song. This is the theme of the Republic. Not the Republic. What's it called? The Resistance. <laughs> and so every time one of those came up again in Last Jedi, I got a little thrill of familiarity. Sure, you know, he plays the Here They Come music from the first Star Wars. And psychologically, you go back there and all that. And when the Falcon goes into one of the mines or whatever being chased by TIE fighters, he plays like the the notes that he played when the Falcon went into the asteroid field. And yeah, it's, it's so short, but it's there. And you're just like, ah, and you know, Yoda's theme plays again. Luke and Leia gets played when the two of them are reunited. And when Luke gives her the dice, the love theme between Han and Leia is played and, and just, and the, the most powerful one, and I already blew it, but <laughs> it, was, it was two hours ago. It was in a, you know, an, an earlier That Gets My Goat when the dedication to Carrie Fisher comes up and they play Princess Leia's theme. They just play a bar of Princess Leia's theme, I think. It's just, wow, emotionally impactful in a way that maybe words aren't, maybe even images aren't. Yeah, music is just one of those things that bypasses all the filters, I guess. It just goes right in there and uh, does its thing. It doesn't pass through the brain. You know, it just shoots straight into the, what, amygdala or medulla oblongata. The the Maz Kanata. Something. Yeah, that's, that's the word I was trying to think of. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Whatever it is that, you know, controls your lizard brain, as I've heard people uh, call it a lot, you know, that just the emotional center, the the non-cognitive part of you, you know, it seems like music tends to speak all the way down on that level instead of in the upper levels, which makes it a very, very powerful thing and not a big surprise that uh, it's such an important part of culture and just human life in general. 
Well, there we go. And, oh, I, I didn't tell you this. I did tell Marshall this. I saw it on opening night, and there was a little bonus thing in between the movies where Ryan Johnson came out and presented the movie, and then he did a featurette with John Williams talking about the music that we were about to hear and scoring these mo- scoring eight movies and being able to reuse themes and all that stuff. And, and, and he ended it with, you know, and I'm really looking forward to doing one more, to doing episode nine. And uh, I, I, I guess I said that we didn't need an episode nine, but uh, <laughs> if it keeps John Williams alive, yes, I need an episode nine. That's right. We need episode nine and episode nine part two to do uh, Avengers uh, Infinity War or Harry Potter out of this episode nine. Well, I'm falling asleep here in my chair, so I think it's time that we call this thing. Time of death, 2.18 a.m. <laughs> oh, the, the fans have all gone to sleep long ago. Well, thank you, man, for <laughs> sacrificing your entire night for me or for the fans or for i you know i don't know no problem for rose tico and so uh you have deserved a a pleasant slumber all right well yeah thanks for talking me with it i talking with me about it yeah it was one of those things that you know right after you saw it i remember you called and you wanted to talk to me about it but i hadn't seen it yet and uh, you're just like, ah, oh, I, I need somebody that I can talk to about it because I, I need to process. And a lot of the stuff I can't process without actually telling someone. And uh, I feel the same way. And I think I was able to, to do so with, through our conversation. So to have been able to do so. And I hope uh, listeners enjoyed it. Uh, and I'd love to hear what it is that you know what they agreed with what they don't agreed with what they thought about the stuff that we brought up and uh etc we've got the forum where you can do that on we do a post for everything that we do so you can get on there and comment there or you can uh, just leave a comment right on the blog page about it or on facebook or wherever you want to put it um but yeah let us know what you thought i'd love to uh take the conversation further well done, sir. Go ahead and uh, take an extra 10 minutes of sleep tonight on me. All right. Let me uh, play us out now. Thanks for listening, everybody. See ya. All right. Enjoy your porg. K- Kentucky Fried Porg. <laughs> Hot, crispy, juicy porg. That sounds really dirty. <laughs> You know what gets my goat? That this show is produced under your Creative Commons 3.0 license. Why would you bother? (laughs) Shit, I can't remember the guy's name. Help me out. Kylo Ren. No, the code breaker. What's the actor's name? Oh, Benicio Del Toro. Okay. Thank you.